In the last few videos, we've built out the three setting control types that we'll be using in our settings menu. In this final video, we'll bring everything we created together by adding the functionality to switch tabs and display a unique list of settings for each tab. So let's get started by creating the visuals for our tabs. First, we need to make some space for them. I'll do that by top aligning the banner and then sizing up the header a bit so that it comes down closer to the body. Then I'll add a new UI block under the header called tab bar. This will be the root for all of our tabs. I'll bottom align it, expand the width, and adjust the height up to about 70. Next, let's add a UI block 2D under the tab bar called settings tab and expand its height. We want the width of the tabs to adjust based on the text contained in the label, so let's add a label text block. I'll set the text to camera for now, change the font to the electrolyze font we've been using, and set the font size to 48. Now we can shrink the text block on both axes, as well as shrink the settings tab on the X axis to get it to match the size of the label. Although let's also set a padding of 16 on the left and right sides to give it some breathing room. Now let's adjust how the tab looks. I'll set the color to a transparent black, add a linear gradient using a toned down semi-transparent version of our accent color, add an inner shadow that uses a semi-transparent version of our accent color, and finally round the corners. The last thing we're going to add is an arrow that indicates whether the tab is the currently selected tab. So let's add a UI block 2D called selected indicator, lock the aspect ratio, set the size to 30, rotate it by 45 degrees, and then position it down at the bottom center of the tab. Then change the color to a transparent black and add a linear gradient using our accent color that starts at the bottom corner and fades up across the bottom half. Depending on how much you sized up your header earlier, you may need to readjust it now so that the arrow doesn't render over the menu's body. And finally, to soften up the arrow a bit, let's round the corners. Now, to get an idea of what the tabs will look like, let's duplicate it a few times and enable auto layout on the tab bar. Set the alignment to center and adjust the spacing based on how far apart you want your tabs. And with that, we finished designing the visuals for our tabs, so let's add the data type that will be used to populate them. Create a new script called Settings Collection, and while there are many different ways we could set this up, the way we're going to do it is by making Settings Collection be a scriptable object. So make it inherit from the scriptable object class, and for now just give it a category string. We'll come back and add more to it later. And in order for Unity to create a menu option so that we can create the settings collections, be sure to also add the create asset menu attribute. Now, back in Unity, I'll make a new folder called Save settings, and here I'll create several instances of our settings collection. And just like with each of our control types, we need to create an item visuals for our tab. So let's create a new script called tab button visuals. Make tab button visuals inherit from item visuals and mark it as serializable. Then add a reference to the label, background, and selected indicator. We're going to change the tab's background color whenever it is the selected tab. So let's add two colors, one for the default color and one for the selected color. We're also going to change the tab's gradient based on the interaction state. So let's add three more colors for the default, hovered, and press states. Now we can switch back to Unity and add the tab button visuals to our tabs. Add the item view component and set the type to tab button visuals. Drag in the label, background, and selected indicator. We'll leave the default color as the transparent black and set the selected color to be a toned down version of our accent color. Then let's paste in the gradient color we picked earlier as the default gradient color, use a brightened version of it for the press color, and split the difference for the hovered color. Finally, be sure to add the interactable component as well. And with that all set up, let's open up our settings menu script and add the tab switching functionality. First, we'll need a list of settings collections that will be our tabs, as well as a list view which will populate with that list of tabs. Now, in the start method, let's add a data binder that maps the settings collection type to our tab button visuals. And just to refresh ourselves on what this is doing, by calling this method we're telling the tab bar, whenever you see a settings collection in the data source, give us a prefab with the tab button visuals on it. And in the bind tab method, we'll update the tab's label with the settings collection category name. We also want to make sure that the tab is in the deselected state by default. So let's add an is selected property to the tab button visuals, which will simply set the active state of the selected indicator, as well as update the background color. And now we can set that property to false in the bind tab method. Next, let's add gesture handlers for hover, press, release, and unhover. And like our toggle and dropdown, these will be visual only, so we'll implement them as static methods on the tab button visuals class. 
In the implementation of these, we'll simply change the background's gradient color to the color we had defined for that interaction state. Back in the Settings menu class, let's add one more gesture handler for click, this time implementing it in the Settings menu class itself. In the click handler, we're actually just going to call another function which will handle switching tabs, so add another method called select tab, which takes in a tab button visuals and the index of the tab we should switch to. We need to track which tab is currently selected, so let's also add a member to track the currently selected index. Now, in the select tab method, if the new index is already the selected index, there's nothing for us to do, so we'll return early. Otherwise, if the old selected index is valid, we'll try and get the old selected tab using the try get item view method of the list view so that we can set its selected state to false. Finally, we'll update the selected index with the new index and set the selected state of the provided tab button visuals to true. Now we can call select tab in our click handler, and with that we finished implementing all of our tab related event handlers. So now we can set the data source on the tab bar by calling the list view set data source method and passing in the settings collections list. And one thing worth mentioning here is that whenever we call set data source, the list view will immediately try to pull in and bind items. So make sure to add your data binders before setting the data source, otherwise the list view won't know how to bind things and will get an error. The last thing we want to do is to have the settings menu open to the first tab. So after we've set the data source, let's get the first tab's visuals, again using the try get item view method, and then call select tab with it. Now we can switch over to Unity and test this out. First, let's turn the settings tab into a prefab so that we can use it with the list view, as well as delete the three dummy tabs we added. Next, let's add a list view to the tab bar and provide it with the prefab we just created. And finally, serialize the tab bar's list view on the settings menu and drag in the settings collection assets we created earlier. And if we play, we can see that the menu starts with the first tab selected, the tabs respond to hovers, and we can click on tabs to select them. So we have the base tab switching functionality working, but of course, when we select a tab, we want it to do more than just highlight the tab. We want it to populate the menu with a list of settings belonging to that tab. We've actually written most of the code to get that working. We'll just have to make a few adjustments. But before we can get into that, first we need to make our settings collection actually store a list of settings that we can use to populate the menu. So let's open up our settings collection class. Here we'll add a list of settings, but since we're using our base setting class to serialize these settings, we'll need to add the serialize reference attribute so that we can serialize the child types like bool setting and float setting, as well as the type selector attribute, which will give us a nice editor that allows us to select which of the child settings types we want to add. The source for the type selector attribute can be found in the settings menu repository linked in the description. Now that we've added that, if we switch back to Unity and select one of our settings collections, you'll see that when we add a new setting, we can select which type of setting we want it to be and then fill in all of the required info for that setting. I'm going to go through each of our settings collections and add several settings to them so that we have some data to populate our menu when we switch tabs. And once that's done, we can open up our settings menu script and make the changes necessary to populate the menu. First, add a list view for our settings list, as well as get rid of the temporary data sources and item views we added to test our controls. This will cause several errors to show up, but we'll go through and fix those now. In the start method, instead of manually calling our bind methods to bind our test controls to our temporary data sources, we're going to register the bind methods on the settings list view so that the list view will call them as needed when it populates the list. To do that, however, we need to modify our bind methods a bit. First, they need to take in a third argument, which is the index of the item being bound in the underlying data source. Additionally, instead of taking in the setting directly, it will receive the onBind struct genericized to the setting type. To get the instance of the data source setting, we can simply use the user data field of the onBind struct. Let's make these same changes to our other two bind methods, and be sure to also register both of them on the list view. And since we no longer need to manually call bind, let's get rid of those calls as well. Now, we still have some errors in the file, and that's because our gesture handlers are trying to access the temporary data sources, which no longer exist. To fix this, we'll move our gesture handlers over to being registered on the settings list instead of the root UI block. This way, the gesture handlers will be provided with the index in the data source of the item being gestured. Then, if we add a helper property to get the list of settings for the currently selected tab, we can index into that list to get the setting corresponding to the item being gestured. And other than making sure the rest of our gesture handler uses this setting instead of our old temporary data sources, the logic for our gesture handlers stays exactly the same. Let's make these same changes to the other two gesture handlers. 
Finally, the last thing we need to do is set the data source on the settings list whenever a new tab is selected. So let's add a call to set data source at the end of the select tab method. And then we can switch over to Unity, hook everything up, and test this out. First, let's turn all of our settings controls into prefabs and delete them from the scene. Then, let's add a list view to the controls UI block and drag in our three settings prefabs. And finally, drag in the list view to the settings menu script. Now if we play, the menu gets populated with the list of settings, and whenever we switch tabs, the menu updates with the settings belonging to that new tab. However, if we take a look at the camera settings collection, we can see that it has 10 settings, but only 5 are being shown. That's because the list view only pulls in items until its viewport is filled. To make the rest of the settings accessible, let's add a scroller component to make the list scrollable, as well as a clip mask to clip any content that is outside of the bounds. Since we've made the list scrollable, we should probably add a scroll bar to give the user a visual indicator that they can scroll the list, so let's do that. I'll stop playing and reapply the scroller and clip mask. Then, to give us space for a scroll bar, let's set the left and right margin on the body of the menu to 64. Next, I'll add a UI block 2D to the body to be our scroll bar. I'll right align it, set the width to 40, the height to 100%, and then move it over so that it's to the right of the controls container. Then I'll set the color to white, add a horizontal linear gradient using our accent color, round the corners, and add an inner shadow also using our accent color. Now let's provide the scroll bar to the scroller component we just added, and if we want to make the scroll bar draggable, all we need to do is check the draggable scroll bar property on the scroller. Since we didn't add an interactable to the scroll bar, this will prompt us to do so, so select yes, and then if we play, as we scroll through the settings, the scroller automatically adjusts the size and position of the scroll bar. And since we checked the draggable scroll bar property, we can also click and drag the scroll bar to scroll the list. And that brings us to the end of the final video in this series. We now have a fully functional, data-bound settings menu with tab switching, drop-downs, toggles, and sliders. Hopefully that gets you started with using Nova.